Okay, so now we'll start again. <laughs> Welcome to Celebrate Women in Mathematics. I'm going to pass um, a video about the project and the, the event, only write, writing in Portuguese, but you can enjoy the music and the spirit. Right. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> I'm back, and uh, this is uh, the the feature of NOS, our event and the, our project. Uh, along the week, we are going to put uh, the the participants of this uh, this this uh, edition. By now, I would like to to thank our colleagues. Let me put it here. Oh, sorry. Oh, I would like to. Stop share. Yes, OK. And now.
this is our uh, organizing committee of the uh, celebrating in 2023. Me, Maria João Rezende, from Universidade Federal Fluminense, Graziele Jorge from Unifesp, Jaqueline Mesquita from UNB and uh, Universidade de Brasília and uh, uh, Vice President of uh, the Mathe Brazilian Mathematical Society, Elaine Silva from UFAL, Universidade Federal de Alagoas, é, Nedir do Espírito Santo, Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro, Valci Santos, Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro. I would like to thank you all to, to make this event possible. And uh, I would like to thank our sponsors here, Instituto de Matemática da Universidade do Rio de Janeiro, Sociedade Brasileira de Matemática, Centro de Ciências Matemáticas e da Natureza da Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro, Sociedade Brasileira de Matemática Aplicada e Computacional e o Grupo de, de Mulheres e Comissão de Gêneros da mesma, Serra Pilheira e Faperge, principalmente, a Fundação Carlos Chagas, filho de Amparo à Pesquisa do Estado do Rio de Janeiro. Uh, our, our event is almost... Uh, all of it supported to uh, on FAPERG, uh, the Programa de Apoio à Organização de Eventos Científicos e Tecnológicos e de Inovação do Rio de Janeiro. Project Celebrate Women in Mathematics, Celebrando a Mulher na Matemática 2023. Welcome everyone. In a few minutes, we have our first plenary talk, <coughs> and I'm, I'm going to uh, to, to, I would like to say that it's an honor to receive here Professor Ellen Byrne, and I would like to pass the, the, the word to Stefanella Boato from Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro, who is the host of the plenary talk. Welcome, Stefanella. Thank you, Luciana, and uh, welcome, Professor Ellen Byrne. So, uh, Professor Allenberg is Professor Fellow in Mathematics at Keeble and Professor at the Mathematical Biology in the Mathematical Institute at Oxford University. Actually, she's Oxford all the way. She graduated from Oxford and she uh, has um, more than 200 publications and she forms, she's a great, great mentor. She's for over 40 graduate students and a lot of uh, also supervise a lot of uh, postdocs. Uh, in 2018, she received the Lee Adel Science Award from the Society of Mathematical Biology. And she's actually a fellow of the same uh, society since uh, 2021. Uh, she has an outstanding uh, work in the field of mathematical biology. So it's uh, a great honor to have her with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Byrne. So thank you. Thank you very much. So um, it's a great pleasure to be able to talk to you all today. Um, it's a shame we can't be together in person, but um, I think this is a very good second best. Um, yes. So let me just see if I can do the technical stuff, which isn't my strongest point, I have to say. <laughs> um, can you see that okay? Yes, yes, perfect. Um, so what I wanted to try and do today is just share with you a few different case studies which I hope illustrate some of the ways in which we can use mathematics, whether that be mathematical modeling or topological data analysis, to try to increase our understanding of different aspects of tumor growth. So I guess um, to start with, um, tumours are complicated. I think that goes without saying. Um, and they their complexity is manifest in a number of different ways. We can see at um, a patient level, different patients will respond differently to the same type of treatment. 
Um, tumors um, can be different at the spatial scale in terms of their composition. And an individual tumor can be heterogeneous or different in terms of its temporal dynamics. And so what I want to do today is the three different case studies that I will present are really designed to focus on each of these different sort of levels of heterogeneity. So the first question that I'm going to look at is um, why do patients respond differently to radiotherapy? Then we'll look at um, um, some experimental data from growing clusters of tumor cells in the lab and look at the shapes of um, how the shape of these clusters of cells changes over time and see if we can exploit that to distinguish um, clusters that are derived from cells with different genetic mutations or that have been exposed to different treatment groups. And then finally, um, I'll look at a smaller scale again and present um, a computational model to um, understand how interactions between tumor cells and immune cells at the cell scale, how that can influence the way in which the tumor grows, whether it's able to persist and spread, whether the immune response can successfully eliminate the tumor. So um, I guess, um, if you have questions, we can probably put them into the chat. But if anything, if you can't hear or anything, then please just do let me know. Um, so um, again, I wasn't quite sure of the audience. So I thought I would just give a very short sort of motivation for why we're interested in mathematical modeling. Um, and I guess mathematical modeling can help when we're looking at um, applied problems, particularly trying to understand um, biomedical systems such as tumors, how they grow, how they respond to treatment. And the sort of um, value that I add um, comes at many different levels. I guess typically an experimentalist will generate data. They look at that data and they can try and generate some hypotheses from the data. Mathematical model is a way of kind of testing whether those hypotheses are consistent. We write down equations that um, embody the hypotheses, we solve the equations, we compare with the data. If there's good agreement, then we conclude that the hypotheses provide a good explanation. If there's not good agreement, then we need to question the hypotheses and the modeling assumptions, iterate till we get good agreement. In that way, we increase our understanding of what we think is driving a particular system. Once we have a model that agrees with the data, then I guess further added value comes from using that model, pushing it into parameter regimes which haven't been seen experimentally, generating predictions that can then be tested experimentally. So obviously I'm a little bit biased, but there are many different ways in which mathematical modeling can be helpful. And at the same time, it, it's not a one way thing in terms of the modeling helping the experimentalists. Often the experimental data, the questions that are being answered can sort of stimulate new mathematics as well. And I hope to give you a flavor of some of those different elements through the three case studies that we're going to look at today. So just to remind you, time permitting, I'd like to go through three different case studies. As I've already mentioned, the first will be looking at some patient data looking at the ways in which patients respond to radiotherapy and trying to see if we can predict how much data we need in order to be able to accurately predict what a patient's outcome is likely to be. Then we'll look at um, some methods for trying to um, quantify and describe the shape of multicellular clusters of tumor cells, how those change over time, and um, whether we can distinguish between different cell lines and plus or minus treatment. And then finally, we'll look at um, a multi-scale model which focuses on tumor interactions with macrophages, which is a type of immune cell, and how the um, microenvironment in which the cells find themselves, how that can influence um, the tumor's growth dynamics. 
Okay, so um, in order to get started, let's focus on um, the first case study where we're going to be looking at um, clinical data from head and neck cancers and trying to, to predict um, patient outcomes in response to radiotherapy. And through the talk, I've tried to indicate who are the people who obviously really did the work. And in this case, um, Tom Lewin was a PhD student several years ago, and Alex Browning is a postdoc. And together, they, they um, really have driven this work, which is in collaboration with the Moffitt Cancer Center in Florida. So here's, here's some of the data that we had from the Moffitt Cancer Center. So it's from um, a cohort of patients with head and neck cancer, and they received radiotherapy five days a week, and their tumors were measured um, once a week. And you can see from these plots, don't need to look too differently, the main point here is that not all patients respond in the same way. In the top left, we have a fast responder, so they start treatment, I think, at two weeks at T equals 14. And you can see a monotonic decrease in the tumor volume over time, indicating that the radiotherapy, when it's being applied, is killing tumor cells. And we would call this a good fast responder. But we can see other sorts of dynamics. Um, bottom, bottom right, you can see a patient whose tumor initially grows. Um, and so you might think that they're not responding well, but eventually they start to respond. So there are many different sorts of cases. And what the experimentalists or the clinicians want to know is how much data do I need before I can predict where a patient is headed, what sort of outcome they're going to have. And um, so in order to try and sort of answer that question, we need to build a mathematical model and it should have two different elements. One is to describe how the tumour grows in the absence of treatment, and then we layer on the response to radiotherapy. So as a starting point, probably the simplest model of tumour growth that we might propose is the logistic um, growth law. And so if you look at the plot, this shows a typical growth dynamic. This is of a tumour that's growing in, in, in the lab, but um, it's, I think, reasonably realistic. So when the tumor is small, the cells are well nourished, they grow um, near exponentially. Oops, sorry. Um, over time, um, nutrient availability becomes less, and so the growth rate slows, and eventually the tumor plateaus at some sort of steady state equilibrium size, where perhaps there's a balance between the rate at which cells are proliferating and the rate at which cells are dying. And arguably, the simplest model that would exhibit that qualitative behavior is the logistic growth law, as I've written in the box here, where the rate of change of volume is um, proportional to the tumor volume, but modulated so that as the tumor gets bigger, the growth rate slows and until it reaches its carrying capacity, K. And so if you plot this, it looks very much like this increasing saturating growth dynamic that we see in experimental data. So that's a very simple model of tumor growth. And now we need a model for how for the cell kill due to radiotherapy. And for simplicity here, what we're going to use is a well known phenomenological model known as the linear quadratic model. And basically what this says is if I expose the tumor tissue or a tissue to radiotherapy of dose D, then the proportion of cells that survive exposure to radiotherapy is given by this um, function form here. So it's an exponential of um, D, um, which is quadratic in, in the dose of radiotherapy. So alpha and beta here are parameters which characterize a tissue's response to radiotherapy. Roughly speaking, you can think of alpha as being sort of an immediate response to cell death. And um, the quadratic term is capturing cells which maybe are not fatally damaged, they're a bit, a bit damaged and they die later because they're unable to repair the damage that they've um, been exposed to. So this is a well-known classical model that's widely used. And so if we put these two 
um, pieces together, then um, a suitable simple model might look like our logistic growth model, which describes tumor growth between um, exposure to radiotherapy. Then we apply radiotherapy at some time T, say, and then we use the linear quadratic law to, to relate the tumor volume just after radiotherapy at time T plus to the volume just before at time T minus. And so the linear quadratic model says that the volume just after radiotherapy is related to the volume just before with a scaling factor, which is our survival fraction, which is given by um, the linear quadratic model. I hope that makes sense. Um, perhaps to make it more visual, here's just a couple of examples to show you what that would look like. So we have two different patients who differ in terms of their carrying capacities in the logistic growth law. We let their tumours grow up to some time t equals zero. Um, the solid lines show the growth dynamics post um, t equals zero, show, show the tumours uh, evolving to their carrying capacity. And then we also compare that untreated growth with the sawtooth dynamics which um, model our exposure to radiotherapy. And here, what we're doing is we're um, treating the patients with radiotherapy Monday through Friday. And so you can see if perhaps you look at the black curve. So we treat on day zero, we see a reduction due to linear quadratic. Then the tumor grows for the rest of the day. We come back on Tuesday, irradiate again, we see a reduction. And so we see this characteristic sawtooth dynamics, and then we see regrowth over the weekend. Okay, so this is a typical response to radiotherapy, which would be predicted by this growth model. Now let's go back and look at the data again. Or well, let me see if I can try and change the slides. Oh, I don't know what's happened there. Sorry. Uh, OK, thank you. Um, so just to remind you, this is the clinical data. So the model that I just pr proposed would do a good job of describing the dynamics of the fast responder, but it won't be able to describe a pseudo progressor or any of these other responses. So that then raises the question. The simple model can't explain the clinical data. What, what shall we do? So that first step in terms of trying to validate our model against the data, we fall over. So we need to think about the assumptions and propose a new model. And the key idea in the new model is to relax the assumption that when we irradiate, the dead cells immediately disappear. And so what we're going to do instead is rather than just keep track of the tumor volume as a whole, treat it as a homogeneous mass, we're going to assume that it's comprised of two components. We have viable cells, which undergo logistic growth, but when, when cells die or when they're irradiated, they become dead or necrotic material, okay? So rather than just having one equation for the viable tumor volume, we couple that to a second differential equation for the um, volume of dead material. So when we irradiate, that will create a source of dead material. And we assume that the dead material decays at some rate, um, uh, zeta, if I've got my Greek letters pronounced correctly. Um, we also have an additional mechanism of natural cell death. So when a cell reaches a certain age or if it's starved of nutrients, then there's a background rate of cell death um, given by um, constant of proportionality eta. So if we take this model and simulate it, and sparing you the details, it turns out, so the pink lines on this curve that I've shown you a couple of times now are actually fits of that model to the clinical data. And the sort of pink shading is our confidence intervals in those fits. So I hope you'll agree that this model is indeed, it has the flexibility to capture the different qualitative behaviors that we see in the experimental data. And so we fit the model to our patient cohort. And this, this um, plot is just showing you how, as we 
fit the model to each individual patient and look at the values of the different parameters in the model, we can see that um, the parameter values seem to cluster according to the response that we see. And so I've drawn boxes around certain parameters that sort of, I think, make this point most clearly. So if you look at this box, which shows you the estimates of the radiotherapy cell kill and the tumour growth rate, you can see the different colours here correspond to patients who are characterised as, according to their dynamics, as either a fast responder, poor responder, et cetera, et cetera. And so I hope you'll agree that when we fit our model, that the parameter values that it estimates for each different patient do indeed seem to um, separate the patients into di different clusters based on their parameter values, and that those clusters can be identified with the outcomes that we observe. And I guess furthermore, what this does is it gives us some sort of suggestion as to why different patients are responding differently. And that's due to differences in the, um, their responsiveness to radiotherapy, differences in the rate at which the dead material dies, et cetera, et cetera. So the model and fitting it to the data, um, first of all, the, the patients cluster in a sensible way. And secondly, it gives us an idea of how these parameters, these patients are differing in terms of their, um, the dynamics or responses of their tumor cells. And just as a final bit, if, I, if you remember, the original purpose of this work was to try to predict patient outcomes given data um, during a, um, um, a course of radiotherapy. So this set of results here is taking um, uh, patients that we excluded from the original parameter fitting. And what we do here is we gradually provide more and more data. And you can see that as we have more time points, then our ability to accurately predict different outcomes um, increases. And I think what you can also notice is our ability to predict, say, a good responder or different outcomes, um, the, our ability to accurately predict different outcomes very much varies with the sort of outcome. So it's quite difficult to predict these pseudo progressors. And that's partially because this isn't a very big case study. So we didn't have that many of those patients in the data. But I guess just to summarize, um, just a simple example of how we can use very simple mathematical model to try to interpret clinical data to understand and predict patient outcomes and to show what level of data is needed in, in order to be able to accurately predict what a patient, how they're going to respond to treatment and how quickly we can be confident in those predictions. And I guess that's important because if a patient isn't responding, then we want to perhaps think about altering their treatment. Okay, so... Um, I hope um, probably that might be a bit slow. So I want to move on now to um, a second case study. And this is work that's been done by a finishing PhD student, Lewis Marsh. And what we're interested in here is um, tumor organoids and um, understanding how their size and shape changes over time. So what's a tumor organoid? So, um, it's basically, if we take some, um, in this case, colorectal cancer cells, and we cluster them in the lab, we add different culture medium, possibly drugs, and we just watch how they grow over time. And you can see that they, um, depending on the cell line, they will um, uh, grow and they will perhaps exhibit quite um, intricate and convoluted shapes um, as they um, grow over time. And so um, we can also grow organoids from different cell types. So here we have um, a wild type, um, type of tumor cell. We can knock out different genes that we think are important in colorectal cancer. Uh, we can have a control where there's no drug. And then we can add a drug. In this case, it doesn't really matter. It's just we've added a drug to either our wild type. And you can see what effect 
adding that drug has if we compare the shape wild type control and the treated and then we have our knockout and we treat it and you can see so this is the sort of data that's available and what we want to do is try and characterize these shapes and see if we can distinguish between either wild type and um, p53 knockout uh, different genetic um, backgrounds and also between control and treated organoids and um, so that just um, summarizes what I think I've already said. And the way in which we do this is using something called the Euler characteristic. Um, so the Euler characteristic is about characterizing the shape of objects. So two different sort of objects here. Um, and if by definition, um, we characterize all the Euler characteristic is trans is defined to be the number of vertices minus the number of edges or equivalently you can think of that as so we have four vertices and four edges for the shape on the left hand side so its Euler characteristic is zero by contrast the shape on the right hand side has um I guess is it uh I don't know it's got one two three four um five vertices and um, four edges. So its Euler characteristic is one. Um, equivalent definition is the number of connected components. So these vertices are all connected together. So there's one connected component and one loop. By contrast, on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, sorry, we've got all of the points are connected, one connected component, no loop. And so the Euler characteristic is one. And so we can apply this idea, this concept, to our organoids. So here, just I'll just show you a video for how we um, make this work. So you can see an organoid um, shape, 2D projection on the left-hand side. And what we're going to do is we have a plane and we're going to sweep it across. And we're going to keep track of the number of connected components and how that's changed, changes as we sweep across the shape. So initially when, and then what we do is we normalize by the, the mean, and then we can integrate to get um, a smooth Euler characteristic, which is the blue line, okay, for a given sweep. So I think we'll see this again now. So we sweep across and we generate this smooth Euler characteristic transform, which represents something about the shape of the um, organoid. And we can rotate the direction in which we sweep across the um, organoid and we can do all different angles and we can generate signatures um, for each different plane. So and if we summarize all of those together across all different directions, we get um, a topological summary, which is rotationally invariant, which summarizes the shape of our organoid. Okay, I hope that sort of makes sense. So we take our object, we sweep a plane across it, we keep track of, of how many connected components we have, we then normalize it and um, integrate smoothly across to generate um, a smooth Euler characteristic transform for a given direction. We then sweep across all different directions to generate um, a single curve which characterizes the shape of our organoid at a particular time point. We calculate the Euler characteristic transform at multiple time points, concatenate all of the um, summaries over time, and that's what we're going to use to characterize how our organoid, how its shape changes um, over time. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Um, now, you might ask a very good question. That seems like a very, very complicated and laborious thing to do. Why don't you just do something much simpler, like work out the sort of um, major, minor, sort of circumscribe it with an ellipse, calculate the area, calculate the ratio of the major and minor axes, et cetera, et cetera. 
Now, it turns out that the Euler characteristic transform, because of the way that it's constructed, indeed characterizes, you can regress out all of these different classical shape descriptors from the Euler characteristic transform. So indeed, we can work out an equivalent diameter, et cetera, et cetera. So um, in truth, with one measurement of the Euler characteristic transform, we get for free all of these other pieces of information at the same time, which I think is part of its power. It's sort of like um, an uber statistic. And if, if we now apply that methodology to some of our real organoids, then what we find is if we apply it to our knockout control and treated organoids, it's able to um, accurately distinguish them um, at approximately 70%. Um, which is, I guess, better than sort of um, uh, pure chance. Um, uh, so it's it's better. And if you use the classical shape descriptors, then that's no better than um, just guessing. Okay, So it does add value by sort of combining multiple um, uh, shape descriptors at one time. Um, I guess a further advantage of um, the Euler characteristic transform construction is that it generalizes naturally to 3D. It doesn't really matter. And sort of to demonstrate that, we applied it to synthetic data that was generated by colleagues in the States, John Lowengrub, who grew, um, they had a mathematical model to describe the growth of organoids in 3D. And this is just showing you three different simulations where they varied one of the model parameters, which relates to the proliferation rate of the cells. I guess the bottom line, the thing to notice here is as you change this parameter, the shape of the organoids changes. They grow less rapidly. Um, and what we do is apply our Euler characteristic transform to this synthetic data and see what, what we can find. So we take our um, uh, concatenated uh, Euler characteristics at the multiple time points. We apply principal component analysis to those descriptors. And what we find is that um, if we take just the first two principal components, then the, they cluster according to the proliferation rates that we use to generate the synthetic data. So I guess this, this case study here using synthetic data shows how this methodology can be extended from 2D to 3D, and furthermore, how it can kind of distinguish between different proliferation rates. Um, if you're interested, there's a paper on the archive. And um, we've applied similar methods using topological data analysis to a whole host of other um, applications. If you're interested, I think in the interest of time, I should probably move on. But if you're interested, I'm happy to tell you more about those applications. So what I want to do now is just go to the final case study. And um, so I guess in the first case study, we were looking at patient data at a sort of um, large sort of um, uh, patient scale, just looking at overall tumor volumes. In the study around organoids, we had the shape of a cluster of tumor cells growing in the lab. What I want to do here is go down a scale again and resolve individual cells and understand how they interact with each other within the tumor microenvironment. And this is work that was done by um, a postdoc, Josh Bull, who's funded by Cancer Research UK. So the model is um, reasonably complicated. It's based on um, hypotheses from um, derived from experimental results in a paper by Arvet et al. from 2018. Um, the basic idea is, so these pink crosses represent blood vessels. Um, blood and other things flow through the blood, um, nutrients, et cetera and um, also immune cells, um, including macrophages. So macrophages, as they're flowing through the, the blood vessels, will 
um, enter the tissue in response to chemicals that are being produced by the tumor cells, which are these red dots. When they come out of the tumor, they migrate towards the tumor cells in response to chemoattractants that are being produced by the tumor cells. When they get there, they're programmed to kill the tumor cells. Unfortunately, the tumor cells produce other chemicals which cause the macrophages to change their phenotype. Oops, there should be some other things coming through here, but I don't know why that's not happening. Um, so when, when the macrophages enter the tumor environment, they try to kill off the tumor cells, creating dead um, material, these gray dots. But at the same time, as they're exposed to different chemicals in the tumor microenvironment, they change their behavior from being cytotoxic, trying to kill tumor cells, to working for to promote um, the tumor cells. So they stop trying to kill the tumor cells, they interact with them, and what they do instead is they become sensitive to other chemicals which are being produced by cells around blood vessels. So the macrophages become um, stop killing the tumor cells, they become um, more in favor of the tumor cells, they migrate back towards the blood vessels, and as they migrate, they interact with the tumor cells and help to guide them to the blood vessels. Once they get to the blood vessels, then they're able to help the tumor cells to get into the blood vessels, and then they can travel around to other parts of the body and where they can, say, establish secondary tumors or metastases. Okay, so it's quite wow. a complex. Sorry, is that okay? Um, I can't seem to advance my slides yeah. anymore. Oh, there we go. Yeah, so I don't know why this is happening. Never mind. Um, so I guess this just um, states what I've just described for you. Um, so we can encode all of the this these details into um, a hybrid agent-based model. And um, the next slide just shows you a time course. So you can see we've got some red blood cells sat at the middle of our tissue, pink blood vessels spotted around here. The tumor cells are producing chemicals which diffuse through the surrounding tissue. When the levels of those chemicals at the blood vessels are high enough, macrophages come out, enter into the tissue. These are anti-tumor macrophages. They want to kill the tumor cells. So they migrate by chemotaxis towards the tumor, kill tumor cells, creating these gray blobs. But at the same time, they're kind of exposed to growth factors that are produced by the tumor cells, which make them be behave in favor of the tumor. They migrate back to the blood vessels and they bring tumor cells with them. Okay. So in this particular case, what we see is that initially the tumor cells are doing a good job at trying to kill the tumor The macrophages are doing a good job of trying to kill the tumor cells, but over time they get sort of reprogrammed by the tumor microenvironment and they actually assist the tumor in being able to spread throughout the tissue and also to be able to get into the blood vessels and spread to other parts of the body. Okay. So this is very much along the lines as what was observed experimentally. And so these simulations suggest that the mechanisms that we put into the model, their hypotheses, are indeed compatible with what's observed experimentally. So that's, that's all great um, and confirms what they observed. But I guess one of the advantages of the mathematical model is we can vary model parameters to predict what will happen in different sorts of parameter regimes. So this sort of panel on the right, left-hand side here is showing the how the behavior of the model changes as we vary two parameters, which um, affect the macrophages behavior. So the tumor cells are behaving exactly the same. The only thing that we're changing here is the way in which the macrophages respond. And in particular, we're changing how sensitive they are, the rate at which they're being supplied to the tissue, and also how sensitive they are to the chemoattractant that's pulling them into the tumor nest. So 
In the simulation that I showed you on the previous slide, we were up in this red region where we saw that the tumour was successfully invading. It was spreading out to the blood vessels assisted by the macrophages. OK, so we have invasion. But as we vary the model parameters, we can get other types of behaviour. So if we're down in this yellow region here, then the macrophages aren't very sensitive. They're not going to be drawn into the tumour very quickly. And what we find is that they're excluded from the tumour. So we just get these sorts of patterns. And this, we would say this is an immune cold tumour. So the immune cells aren't getting in at all. In other parameter regimes, so these blue dots, the tumour cells are very sensitive, they migrate in very quickly, and they're able to kill a lot of tumour cells before they get programmed to um, a pro-tumour phenotype. So what we can see is that just by changing the macrophage sensitivity to um, a particular chemical, we can get all different sorts of behaviour. Same tumour cells, just changing the characteristics of our immune cells. Okay. Um, I guess we can pull other pieces of information about the sort of phenotype, but I think to hear this really doesn't matter. So we validate our model. We show that it reproduces the same qualitative behavior that's observed experimentally. We perform um, a two parameter sweep and we can observe different behaviors not seen experimentally. And we can understand why those behaviors might arise. Um, and you can see that the sort of spatial patterns that are observed for those different behaviours are quite different. And I guess the other thing is that these sorts of patterns would be quite similar to the sort of data that you might get from histology images that are taken from a patient. So one of the other things that we wanted to do is try and see if we can characterise using spatial statistics the different spatial patterns that our models generate and see if we can use those spatial statistics to characterize and distinguish the different qualitative behaviors that the model exhibits. So that, as I've, I've sort of already said, question that we want to answer is how can we characterize the different spatial patterns that our agent-based model generates? And I guess to cut a long story short, we construct a whole host of different spatial statistics, pair correlation functions that characterize um, the relative locations of our tumor cells, macrophages and blood vessels. We can do that over time or I think in this particular case, we just take a snapshot from um, the last time in our simulation at t equals 500, doesn't really matter. And we can concatenate all of these different spatial statistics together. And in the same way as with the first study, we can then use principal components analysis to reduce the dimensions of our um, multiple spatial statistics. If we do that and look at the first three principal components, we find that they're able to explain, I think it's 96% of the variance in, in the data. So, and you can see we've colored the clusters according to the behavior, whether we have um, tumor escape, the tumor cells migrate to the vessels. We have equilibrium, which is where the immune cells are unable to penetrate the tumor, or we have tumor elimination. And I hope you'll agree that we're able with pretty good um, accuracy, I was surprised at how well this looks, to just by taking these um, images from a fixed time point to cluster, to characterize the different um, qualitative behaviors that the model exhibits. Um, as a further test of um, the insight that the spatial statistics um, offer, what we also did was we performed a more extensive parameter suite, varying six rather than two parameters, applied the same sort of spatial statistics. We see a richer sort of um, range of behaviours, but we're still able to get pretty good 91% accuracy in terms of outcomes when we apply these statistics to those um, data. Okay, so just to summarize um, what I've been trying to say with this agent-based model, we developed a model to describe, um, to summarize um, biological hypotheses about how tumor cells and macrophages interact with each other, how those interactions change um, as the environment, uh, the blend of different 
chemicals that the cells are exposed to and how that can change the tumor's growth dynamics. Um, and we've used, um, I guess, spatial statistics and principal components analysis to show how the spatial statistics can kind of pull out the qualitative behaviours that the model exhibits. So um, with that, I think that's probably um, more than enough um, to start with. What I've tried to do, just to remind you, we've looked at three different case studies, which um, I've chosen to try and illustrate the different ways in which we can combine mathematical modeling with parameter estimation and topological data analysis to generate insight into experimental data, whether that be at the population scale for patient cohorts, at the tissue scale for organoids, or at the cell scale if we're looking at histology data. Um, so with that, I think I will um, end just by acknowledging the people who really did the work. That's Alex, Tom, Lewis and Josh. And um, to acknowledge my um, other collaborators and funders to thank you for listening. And I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Oh, and look at the I'm sorry. I, this. Yeah, never mind. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the great, great talk. Uh, really okay. inspiring. Uh, yeah. OK, so I uh, I was very interested in, in the subject also because of application data analysis. I would like to, if you can say something more maybe about the second part, how you further use um, yes, so the other applications of topological data analysis. Yes, yes, to tumor. Yes, um, so very many different applications um, from looking at, um, so if we take um, vascular networks from tumors, mm -hmm. um, 3D networks, and we can calculate loops, connected components, and voids, Mm -hmm. um, these images are very, very big. And so what we have to do there is first subsample before we can kind of do apply the topology. So it's just um, we use a radial filtration where we um, put a mark at the center of the vasculature, expand it out with our subsampled network. And we look at connected components, loops, etc. as we expand out this um, uh, disc from the center of the vascular network. And we applied that to, we had um, data from um, uh, animal studies um, showing how uh, the vascular network um, changes over time. And also in response to different um, sort of chemical treatments and radiotherapy. So people haven't previously been able to um, quantify the effect of radiotherapy on, on the blood vessels. Mm. And so what we were able to do is show how um, the numbers of loops and um, the structure of the vascular network changed following radiotherapy. And then we were able to, to detect differences depending on whether we give just say um, five doses of two gray or one very large different, mm. dis um, one large 10 gray. And mm. so we've been able to quantify um, those differences in the vascular morphology and to show how the morphology changes over time. Oh. Um, and then looked at a variety of other things in terms of using multi-parameter persistent homology to look at immune cell infiltration compare the patterns of infiltration by different types of immune cells. Um, and also at the moment, we're just looking at some work. So there's a lot of interest or um, about how the structure of the tissue matrix in biological tissues, mm -hmm. depending on its architecture, that would influence the ability of say immune cells to infiltrate. So we've been applying other methods to um, quantify and describe the morphology of the extracellular matrix and to see how that relates to the ability of the immune cells to infiltrate and co-localize with the tumor cells. So that's work that's oh. in preparation. The other work is all already published over the last 
um, few years. Oh, very impressive. Very impressive. Yes, yeah, like... so there's a lot of stuff. There's yeah, loads yeah. of lovely, lovely applications, I do think. Yeah. And that's yeah. just something. Yeah. yeah. Something. yeah. We, we have been applied to epidemic data, but the students love to learn about the uh, topological data analysis because it's so, you know, versatile. There is the yes. compute the, the computer part, and then there is the topology, and then there is the modeling. They, they just love it. So. <laughs> so one of the other things that we have been doing is the last piece of work that I talked about this sort of quite complicated agent-based model. So the patterns that we see there, which actually um, the way in which the macrophages are described, they have a continuous parameter which indicates how pro or anti-tumor they are. So they have an extra variable. And so we can apply topological data analysis. We have been, we're just writing up um, a couple of papers on that work where we can kind of use that as another filtration parameter. So there's even using the sort of um, synthetic data from a mathematical model, we can use that as, I guess, um, a test ground for exploring the utility and insight that these different sort of um, topological features can provide. Um, so I think there's an awful lot more work to be done, um, mm, linking the modeling and the TDA. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Really exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would like to, if you then can send some material. Also about the macrophage, how in practice you change this parameter, you know, like uh, you, you can do in the modeling synthetically, but in this so, experiment. So, so that would describe what's happening in vivo. And yeah. so that might those differences might either be that there's not so much chemical being produced by the tumor cells. Mm -hmm. It might be that the macrophages are not so sensitive. They have fewer receptors to these chemokines. Mm -hmm. It might be that you've treated with some sort of immunotherapy that blocks their sensitivity to it. So mm -hmm. there's a number of different ways in which you might see those changes in behavior. Mm -hmm. um, so whilst it's at the present moment, very much a computational study. Uh -huh. um, I think the parameters, they're all meaningful based on real sort of chemokines, not sort of just, you know, um, a spherical cow sort of made up thing. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, uh, and I guess part of the reason is that we can try and link the sort of images that we generate from the mathematical models with the sort of images, the level of detail that you can get from state-of-the-art multiplex images where they can resolve lots and lots of different antibodies. Mm. So um, I think there is a real prospect there where you can get very sophisticated multidimensional um, information about the different cell types, presence of various different sort of um, uh, different genes and proteins. So it could be a difference like in the tumor and also in the sort yeah. of treatment also that yeah. you apply. Uh, yeah. Okay. Very yeah. nice. Very great. Really, really great. Yes. Yeah, so people are saying they're very, thank you for the talk. I also the student and uh, I will really looking forward to receive some material. Okay. Thank you again to, to have this great talk for us. And uh, if, I don't know if you can share eventually the slides uh, will be. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I will do that if, if you would like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah, yeah. All yeah. right. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. you very much for inviting me. It was a pleasure to uh, talk to good. you. I hope you enjoyed. It was an honor. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it was my pleasure. Very much so. Thank yeah. you. And um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the week. Thank well, you. Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Take care. Yeah. Bye bye. You Bye. too. Thank you, Stefanella. Well, we're going to try uh, now to make the sorting, the, the draw of the book. Okay. And, and uh, as we, we said, we are going to make all the names which are here in our list and put in an in a online sorting uh, uh, website and unfortunately we we just can to send it inside brazil so if you are outside from brazil of brazil uh 
I don't know what we, we can't, <laughs> we, we just can't to send it to you. Okay. And okay, let's go. Uh, Maria Joao, you want to share? Yes. É, Para os que estão no Brasil, a gente vai fazer o sorteio. E aí, se você for sorteado, é, mande aqui para a gente o. Bom, primeiro você tem que se inscrever no. no se não estiver inscrito ainda, se inscreva para a gente também ter lá guardado o seu contato. E precisamos do seu endereço completo, tá bom? Which, uh, we need the. Yes. Oh, we have 39 people now, so. Can I put the, the number? Yes, yes. Did you, sh uh, did you uh, share the, have, the list? I have the list here and I will go well. Oh, okay, 32. So you will scan. Poliani. Um, Poliani. Is Polian in Brazil? I hope. <laughs> well, you can send an email to us. Yes. If you... Poliani, uh, send us an email to... Okay, if you're not um, in Brazil, I'm sorry, we can't send it to you, but the the book is this. Let me show you. Hello. Yes. Oi, gente. Bom dia. Bom dia, que bom. Já vi que está aqui. Estou aqui. Ok. This is, it's like this, um, the, o, o nome do livro é Lattes, um, deixa eu só dizer completo para você. É, gente, cadê esse negócio? Uh, Lattes is applied to code into reliable... Uh, and security communications, mathematical grammar of biology, okay? And in, this is an uh, offering of uh, Brazilian uh, Applied and Computational Society. Uh, of, uh, and we thank you so much to SBMAC for the, the gift. And congratulations, Poliani. Se você ainda não está inscrito, inscreva-se e manda aqui para a gente o, o, o seu endereço completo, por favor, tá bom? É joia, obrigada. Nada, parabéns. Obrigada. Thank you. So, Stefanella, thank you so much to, to come and to host and yes. to invite so, so, so great talk of Berlin Burn. And é thank bem. you all for coming, for celebrating with us. And in 15 minutes, we start this, the thematic sessions. Uh, today, the thematic sessions are an analysis, 10 and 15. And 11, 15, we have the thematic sessions of algebra, okay? You are all invited. We are going to send you the, the from email of uh, the the link again, and welcome everyone. Registers <laughs> registering in our event, and see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. João, você tem que sair, né? Vá lá, muito obrigada, viu? É, todo começo é. é assim. Deixa eu parar de...